Hello, BookTube. Well, it's that melancholy moment. It's the last mail haul of the week. Uh, they come faster and faster. <laughs> but we have, we have a few packages here, a handful, and two boxes. One thin and one not thin. So uh, there could be some good stuff here. Let's see. The first one is uh, very light, but it's from one of my favorite publishers, uh, W.W. Norton. So uh, good things could come in small packages from the folks at Norton. They always do. Uh, let's see what we have here. Oh, <laughs> oh my, oh my, uh, okay, this is a Norton Critical Edition, uh, we, we talk about those all the time here, uh, wow, okay, uh, they are, the, in Norton Critical Editions you get the text at the beginning and then you get critical apparatus at the back, essays, history, that sort of thing. They're wonderful for schools, wonderful for students, but when it comes to a lot of the canonical literature that they, they publish with the Norton Critical Editions, we're all students. Uh, I found them invaluable. Uh, even when I know the work really well, I still just find them invaluable. I love them. Uh, and this is, Norton, Norton, they're such wonderful people. This is the latest Norton Critical Edition. This is a new edition of the Epic of Gilgamesh, translated by Benjamin Foster. Look at that cover. Look at that cover. The sunset or the sunrise in the background makes the monkey's fur kind of glow in a gigantic tree. It's, it's a wonderful cover because it's not anything you would associate with the Epic of Gilgamesh. It's, it's not typical. I, how wonderful. Okay, fantastic. Uh, well, I don't think I know this translation. Gilgamesh is a mess to translate. Uh, I don't think I know this translation at all, which makes the, this Norton Critical Edition even better than usual. Uh, because it's going to be all discovery for me. It's the second edition, but I don't think I've ever read the Benjamin Foster translation of Gilgamesh, and that I want to. So that's great. What a way to start! All right, let's uh, let's move on. Uh, it's going to be tough for any of the rest of these books to compete with the earliest work of literature in the world. <laughs> but uh, uh, oh, what have we got here? Did we already see this? This is the finished copy of something that comes out. Uh, Today, <laughs> tomorrow, something like that. It's, it's out now in your bookstores. This is Marcus du Sautoy, and it's the Creativity Code, Art and Innovation in the Age of AI. <laughs> and there she is herself. Uh, what? I don't know that we saw this already. Uh, what does it mean to be human? <laughs> don't get me started. <laughs> Genocide, basically, is what it means to be human. Genocide. <laughs> There's, if you want to come boil it down to one word that it means to be human, Genocide. No other species does it. All humans want to. <laughs> so, but uh, what marks us out as different from all the machines that are threatening to put us out of a job? Is your job threatened by a machine? Tell me stories about that. It, that it's all the rage now to write articles like that. But the, it's always been all the rage to do that. Even in the 60s. There's a Star Trek episode that's built around this anxiety. And it was meant to be ripped from the headlines. Uh, I'm curious to know. I mean, are you seeing automation where you work? I think it's fascinating. Of course, algorithms have been made to write book reviews. <laughs> but they haven't been nearly as sententious and windbaggy as a human being can be. You'll never take that away. <laughs> I shouldn't say that. The Harold Blumatron 2002 is probably on the way. <laughs> uh, could a well-programmed machine do anything a human can't? Uh, traditionally, we've thought that the one place where humans would continue to shine was in the creative arts, a place that depends on being human because it is a reflection of what it means to be human. How can a machine ever hope to replace or even compete with Mozart, Shakespeare, or Rembrandt? And yet, there are extraordinary hints that even what we regard as uniquely human activities might be within the reach of a machine through machine learning, because these things teach each other things, and they learn things that they were not programmed to learn. Uh, Algorithms that interact, learn, and adapt to their environments. But some believe that these algorithms can learn what it means to be human, so much so that it gives us new insights into our own humanity that our narrow sensory window obscures. By interacting with the arts that move us and understanding what distinguishes it from the mundane and bland, might not a machine see opportunities that we are missing because of the constraints that being human entails? The author is essentially asking if machines might actually not only be capable of art, but better at it than humans are. Good lord. I don't think we've seen this on this channel. I certainly have not. 
uh, I don't think seen this before. I am now fascinated. Algorithms fascinate me. They terrify me, but they fascinate me. I don't think that, uh, I mean, newspaper articles, yes, uh, can be written by machine. Obviously, that's been demonstrated. But uh, periodical writing is largely, a, a, I would hope anyway, a factor of people following the personality of the person they're writing, that they're reading, rather than, although maybe that personality can be simulated as well. What would happen? What would an algorithm do if you fed it everything that I have ever published? Aside from maybe blink out of existence. <laughs> if, you, if you could do that, what would it do? Would it actually produce something that, that reads like me? I, you know, the natural impulse is just to rebel against such an idea. But one way or another, uh, fascinating. I am fascinated. So who is Marcus du Satoy? Oh, good Lord. <laughs> okay, well, for one thing, he has the cojones to pull off an author photo like this. <laughs> I couldn't do that. <laughs> he manages to make it work. Uh, he is the Charles Simono Simoni Professor of Public Understanding of Science and Professor of Mathematics at the University of Oxford. And he's the best-selling author of The Music of Primes. I read The Music of Primes, and I did not detect any music. <laughs> he, he was trying his hardest to convince me, to make me understand what he was talking about, and I did not. Uh, a trumpeter and a member of an experimental theater group, he has written and presented over a dozen documentaries. Wow. Okay, and he's won tons of awards, too. So, I, if anybody's going to... I'm in good hands when I read about this. And I don't think I ever got an advanced copy, so I'll have to read this right away. I want to, as well. Uh, and then we'll move on to the boxes. Well, first we'll do the thin box, and then we'll do the thick box. Frida has... Uh, has revived at the presence of the male. <laughs> uh, she has revived a little at the at the presence of male. She was dead on her feet from our enormous walk earlier today. Uh, <laughs> but she doesn't stay dead on her feet for long, bless her. She's, she's still a very young and energetic dog. We went for an enormous walk in the Arboretum. And uh, it's, it's a little bit melancholy, of course, still, because I walked there for years with my girls. And we walked the Arboretum even when they were very old and, and frail and easily tired. We would just take all day to do it. We would take hours and hours to do it. The simplest route in the Arboretum. Because they loved it so much. They, it made them so happy that I indulged them in doing it at their insistence long after I should have stopped. Because it made them so happy to do. And so there, that route and a couple of routes nearby it are still indelibly marked with them. And the, the great thing, once it warms up, the great thing with Frida will be that she and I will be able to, to stake out new routes. <laughs> baby, baby, give it a rest. Give it a rest. Uh, we couldn't, my girls and I couldn't do all the routes that the Arboretum really had to offer. Uh, because even in their prime, Lucy was still a hippo. She was still 85 pounds with tiny little legs and got tired or bored of being tired or whatever. Malin, my pointer, could, and in her prime, could have handled anything, but Lucy not so much. Uh, so there, there are all sorts of places, all sorts of routes that Frida and I can take in the Arboretum that won't have anything to do. I won't have been there with anybody since I was there with a bunch of eagles. Uh, and those time detoxifies that to a certain extent, so I don't have to worry about it. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> let's move on here. Uh, this is new from Oxford. Uh, this is Your Sister in the Gospel, uh, The Life of Jane Manning James, a 19th century black Mormon, by Quincy Newell. Uh, and this comes out in May. She is one of the earliest known black members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. For several decades, however, her story remained relatively absent from the history of Mormonism. She was neither white nor male and therefore did not fit the prototypical Mormon mold. Jane was LDS founder Joseph Smith's personal servant, and since the 2005 bicentennial of Smith's birth, there's been increasing interest in her life. And this is being billed as her first biography, Slim Thing, uh, by a professor of religious studies at Hamilton College. Her first biography. Wow, okay. All right, once again, I don't think I got an advanced copy of this. I think this is just a finished copy reaching my reaching me, and a subject on which I know nothing. Uh, the, so, uh, that was the first box. Now we'll move on to the second box. This one is bigger, bigger. Frida, you aren't even done with the one you were mauling, and you want another one? <laughs> you want another one already? You're such a greedy little puppy.
All right, what have we got here? What? Oh, goodness gracious. Okay. Oh, baby, you can't have the book. Here, you want the box anyway. You don't want the book. <laughs> uh, this one we have seen before, I think. Uh, goodness gracious. Okay, this also comes out in May. This is the finished copy of the new book by Richard Evans. Uh, this is his big biography of the historian Eric Hobsbawm. Uh, I'll just, let me see if I can, I can't, uh, this is probably a uh, partisan specialist to come out of woodwork to review this thing. I don't see that it has any popular interest. Even Richard Evans' name, Richard Evans is a popular historian, but I don't see him selling this to the general public. Uh, at the time of his death in 2012, at the age of 95, Eric Hobsbawm was the most well-known and widely read historian of the modern age. Most well-known, yes. Most widely read, no. Not even close. <laughs> Not even close. Not even a tenth as well as much read, as widely read, as Doris Kearns Goodwin or David McCullough. Not even close. Not even close. <laughs> uh, now, for the very first time, his life and works are meticulously studied in a definitive biography authored by a fellow acclaimed historian. Okay, well, this is 800 pages of a historian's life. I have never yet read a biography of a historian that, that did anything for me. I, they just... I think that's kind of predictable, but uh, nevertheless, I've had an advanced copy of this, and confess, I just sort of sigh when I see it. So now I will, I will rectify that, and I will, I will uh, actually read it. <laughs> so we'll see. Maybe I mean, Evans is a, is a fantastic, entertaining author. Maybe he will do that, regardless of subject matter. So we will give it a try. <laughs> so, so that is the the last mail haul of the week. We have a gigantic 800-page biography of Eric Hobsbawm, a historian. Uh, then we have Your Sister in the Gospel, the very first biography of Jane Manning James, the, uh, a black Mormon, uh, and a black female Mormon. Uh, and then we have uh, The Creativity Code by Marcus de Sartoy, all about uh, whether or not AI is coming for the soft sciences, whether or not it's coming for the arts. Fascinating. Absolutely fascinating. And also a, a new Norton Critical Edition of the Epic of Gilgamesh. How wonderful. I don't think I have any edition of the Epic of Gilgamesh, and now I do. And not only that, but tons of great essays that I'm gonna, it's gonna be so much fun to read. There are a couple of the things uh, in this last mail haul of the week that I'm gonna read right away, uh, which is always fun. Uh, so there you go, that is it. That is, that is what we're doing for now. Since my little bean has revived, the best thing to do is just wear her out again. <laughs> so we will go outside again and walk all around, let her scream at people. <laughs> but I'm, I will be back. Thank you, Book Two.